So even though we can't meet together in the same building, it doesn't change the fact that today is Palm Sunday. And today, a familiar scene plays out for us. A scene and a story that we hear every single year. This is my 39th Palm Sunday. For many of you, you've experienced many more Palm Sundays than I have. And whenever we hear a familiar story, especially one that's read every year, we have a tendency to tune it out, to not pay as close attention as we should. When we hear a passage, especially one that we do read every single year, maybe we can develop an, I've already heard this before, kind of attitude. Maybe we hear the story of the triumphal entry and we think of it only as a cute little Sunday school story where the little children came out to greet Jesus and they grabbed palm branches and they fanned him with it and they took their coats off and they laid them on the track as he walked, rode into Jerusalem. We hear the familiar cries of Hosanna. But if we only think of this story as a cute little Sunday school story, we miss the bigger picture. It's a story that is full of tension. It's full of political intrigue. The entire scene... Jesus making his way from Bethany over the Mount of Olives, down the Mount of Olives, into Jerusalem. The whole scene is politically charged and motivated by Jewish nationalistic pride. So instead of thinking that we know all there is to know about the triumphal entry because we've heard it 39 times or more times than that, Let's learn from it. Let's learn from it. The more I read this scene, the more I learn about it. It's one of the few stories that's contained in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels. Something important happens in this scene if all four Gospel writers share their different accounts of it. The more I read it, the more I learn. And I hope the same can be said for you. The scene of Jesus riding on a donkey to Jerusalem, having palm branches waved in front of him, hearing the familiar cries of, Hosanna! The whole thing is politically charged, nationally motivated. But how? How? And what does this parade mean for Jesus? What does it mean for the crowd? What does it mean for us today? How is the nationalism played out in this scene? What's the underlying political drama that's taking place here? How do we view the triumphal entry and Jesus being hailed as king of Israel in light of what happens later in the story, just a few days later? The story's familiar to us, but let's read it anyway. If you have a Bible with you, turn to John chapter 12. Turn to John chapter 12. We're going to be reading verses 12 to 19 together. John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. Hear the words of God. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. 
Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. These are the words of God. The story of the triumphal entry starts with, with these three words. The next day. The next day. So in studying uh, this story, we need to ask ourselves the, the logical question. If, if the passage starts out with the, the phrase, the next day, we need to ask ourselves the question, well, what happened before? What happened before? Well, in the first 11 verses of John chapter 12, we have the account of Mary anointing Jesus' feet with perfume. We're told in the text, Mary came with the most expensive perfume you can get, one a perfume that cost a whole year's wages. The text calls it pure nard. In my younger days, I played in a band. And the very first name we had for our band was Pierre Nard. I think we improved on the name after that. But Jesus, Mary came. Mary came to Jesus and she took the most expensive perfume you could have. And she smashed the bottle open and she took that expensive perfume. And she washed Jesus' feet with it and took her hair. I don't have any to demonstrate this. But she took her hair and she wiped the perfume off of Jesus' feet with her hair. Anointing him. That's earlier in John chapter 12. In John chapter 11, we have the account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And on the night previous to the triumphal entry, Jesus was at a dinner party in Bethany. And after the party was over, on the next day, Jesus set out from Bethany on his way to Jerusalem. And he did it knowing what lay before him in that city. Notice that John's account of the triumphal entry differs from Matthew, Mark, and Luke's. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account all uh, differ uh, with each other as well. John doesn't supply us with the backstory and the elaborate plan to get a donkey for Jesus. John's account is much simpler. But in John's telling of the triumphal entry, what we see and what John's account of the triumphal entry does is beautifully captures the tension of this story. It beautifully captures the political intrigue, and the politics that are underlying this story. John's story beautifully holds in tension the kind of king Israel was expecting with the kind of king Jesus really is. The way I read the passage, it breaks down like this. First, we have the praise of the people. We hear the familiar cry of Hosanna. After the praise of the people, we see Jesus' response to being hailed as Israel's king. And finally in this scene, John describes for us the two types of people that were around Jesus that day. The first aspect of this passage is, is probably one of the most familiar to us in, in all of the Bible. We know it well. Palm branches. 
Hosanna. But what we might not realize is that everything the people do, and even what they say, is politically motivated. There's also a, a military motif going on here in this passage as well. And the scene is steeped with Jewish nationalism. And if we pay close attention to what John describes the people doing, we see that they, they do three things. First, John writes that the large crowd took palm branches. Remember that this was the time of Passover. Passover being a yearly feast that the Jews celebrated. And it's a feast that required a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Palm branches were associated with this pilgrimage. Associated with other feasts as well. Palm branches were waved as the pilgrims made their way into the city. And since this was Passover time, the population of Jerusalem just boomed and swelled. The historian Josephus said uh, that at one point there was like 2.7 million people. Whether the number is exaggerated or not, what we know is the population of Jerusalem swelled at Passover time. So there were more people in the city than usual. So Jews from all over the region would descend upon Jerusalem. And this particular Passover, I'm sure that rumors about Jesus had been spreading all through the area. Jesus had been doing his itinerant ministry for about three and a half years, making his way around. So I'm sure Jesus' name was quite popular. And word got out that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So a large crowd followed Jesus from uh, Bethany, but also a large crowd from the city came out to meet him. The palm branches weren't only associated with pilgrimage into the city. The palm branches were a symbol of kingship, a symbol of victory. Palm branches were used as a symbol for the Jewish state. Ever since the time of the Maccabees, palm fronds were used to display military victory. Palm branches were minted onto Jewish coins after a revolt against the Romans. And the Romans... Stamped palm branches on their newly minted coins after they destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. They put palm branches on their coins as a symbol that they destroyed the Jewish state. The people bring palm branches to greet Jesus. A symbol of Jewish pride. A symbol of Jesus' kingship. But John uses an interesting phrase here. He says, the people took palm branches. And he writes, did you hear it when we read it? John writes a phrase and he says, they went out to greet him. This is a military expression. It's a military expression when a conquering hero came back to town or a, a king or a dignitary was visiting a town. A welcoming party would go out to meet him. They would go from the town and go out of the town to meet the king as he was making his way. This welcoming party would praise and sing and dance around the king. They went out in order to escort him back into the city. This is what's playing out here. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. The people are pretty sure that he's the Messiah. The people are pretty sure he's the coming king of Israel. So the welcome party goes out. 
palm branches in hand. And they go out to meet their coming king in order to escort him back into the city so that he can take his place on his throne. Along the way, they shout Hosanna, which is the third action we see the people doing. We read it every year. We sing songs. Hosanna in the highest. But do we even know what the word means? The word Hosanna, it means save us now. Save us now. What a beautiful word. Hosanna. Save us now. Save us now, the people cried. Thinking that they knew what Jesus was going to save them from. It's a cry from a psalm of ascent. Sung as the pilgrims were making their way into the city, into the temple. Hosanna, the people cried. But they follow it up with another verse from a psalm. Say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even, and did you hear it when we read it? Did you hear what came out of the people's mouths? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the king of Israel. The king of Israel. That phrase is ripe with political tension. Steeped in Jewish nationalism. The people wanted a king. They wanted a savior. They wanted God's long promised Messiah. And here he is. Making his way into the city. Hosanna, they shouted. They said, save us now. And the people thought that Jesus was there to save them from the Romans. Save us now from Rome's tyranny and Rome's brutality. Save us now and restore Israel to the greatness she once had. They thought this was it. Jesus, a man sent from God. The people's hopes were raised. Their expectations were raised. This was the time that they had been waiting for to come. King Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. And in their minds, he's going to march into the city. He's going to raise up an army and he's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going to take his throne as Israel's king. Emotions were high. Tensions were high. Expectations were high. Jewish pride was bubbling over. This could get out of hand pretty quickly. So how does Jesus respond? How does Jesus respond? Well, Previously in Jesus' ministry, very early on, people wanted to crown him king. And do you remember what Jesus did? Jesus slipped away from the crowd because his time had not yet come. But here, here, at the triumphal entry, Jesus receives and accepts their praise. He doesn't shut them down. He doesn't tell them to put a lid on it. He accepts their claim that he is Israel's king. But in an unusual turn of events, Jesus shows what kind of king he is. And he shows the main characteristic that will accompany the inbreaking of his kingdom. So how does Jesus respond? He's coming into Jerusalem. The people are waving palm branches in front of him. They're shouting, save us now. So what does Jesus do? Does he suit up? 
And he puts his armor on and he mounts his steed and he goes charging into Jerusalem. No. He does pretty much the exact opposite. He does pretty much the exact opposite. Instead of riding a war horse into the city, Jesus rides a donkey. And he rides a donkey for two reasons. First, he rides a donkey in order to fulfill prophecy. And he rides a donkey to show what kind of king he is. We know a lot of prophecies about Jesus. His birth was prophesied by Isaiah in chapters 7 and chapter 9. We know that Micah prophesied the place of Jesus' birth in Micah 5 chapter 2. But the prophet Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, He prophesied that Israel's king would one day ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Yes, Jesus is king, but not the militaristic, nationalistic kind of king that Israel was anticipating. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Israel's king is said to be coming to town riding on a donkey. And with all that's going on around Jesus on this particular Sunday, with the anticipation being ramped up as Jesus takes a seat and he rides into the city, Zechariah said that he would ride into the city on not a war horse, but a donkey. A donkey is a peacetime animal. Zechariah 9.9 9 specifically addresses this mode of transportation. But the following verse, the following verse, Describes for us what kind of kingdom this king will have. Zechariah 9 9 says he will ride in on a donkey. And Zechariah 9 verse 10 says that this king will not be a king of war. He doesn't mount a steed and charge into the city, but he rides on a young donkey instead. Zechariah 9, 9, the verse immediately following this prophecy about a donkey, says this. Here, 9, 9, 2. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt. The foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Did you hear what kind of king and what kind of kingdom? Jesus will have. The king coming king of Israel would have. He will remove, he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. He will cut off, remove the war horse from Jerusalem. Yes, Jesus, king of Israel, as prophesied by Zechariah, will establish a kingdom not through a political coup. Not through a military offensive, but his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven by removing the tools, by removing the instruments of war. 
Jesus rides in on a donkey to fulfill prophecy. To show the people of his day. To show the people of our day. What kind of king he really is. He isn't going to lead a military revolt. He isn't going to lead a political revolution. His kingdom won't come by physically overthrowing the Romans. But his kingdom will come by Jesus submitting himself to the Romans. His kingdom will come by Jesus dying on one of their cruel and brutal crosses. The people thought that they needed liberation, that they needed salvation from the oppressive Romans. That's as far as their thinking went. But Jesus knew that the people, all people, need liberation and salvation from the sin that separates them from God. His kingdom will be a kingdom of humility and peace. Real peace. Not peace through intimidations that the Roman had through their Pax Romana. His kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, will be a kingdom of peace by removing the threat of war. By removing the instruments of war. Jesus' kingdom isn't brought by riding the chariot and the war horse into Jerusalem as much as the people wanted it to. Jesus' coronation as king would happen on a Friday morning. His coronation as king would happen as a crown of thorns was placed on his head as nails were driven through his hands and his feet. His was a coronation by crucifixion. And the events that led there started here. As Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem. In the scene, Jesus fulfills prophecy. He fulfills the words of Zechariah 9.9. But he also fulfills the words of Zechariah 9 verse 10. As he makes a powerful statement about his kingship and his kingdom. And as there always seems to be, there were two groups of people around Jesus that day. There were those who were curious, and there were those who were furious. There were those who were cheering, and they were celebrating, and they were dancing. They were hailing Jesus as king. They were curious about who Jesus was. And what he was going to do next. They had heard about the miracles that he had performed. Specifically they had heard that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So since word was getting out about that miracle that he performed. The crowd gathered around him to see what he was all about. The author admits. The author admits that he and the other disciples missed the significance of this event until after it was revealed to them in the coming and power of the Holy Spirit. So there were those who were curious, eager to find out about who Jesus is, what he was going to do next, how he was going to help and liberate Israel. But whenever Jesus 
said anything or did anything or went anywhere, there is always a second group of people, the furious, the religious leaders, the Pharisees in this case. Whenever we read a gospel story, the religious leaders always seem to be lurking in the background. As Jesus is teaching, they are lurking in the background, plotting. As Jesus is performing miracles, there they are, lurking in the background, making a plan. As Jesus is eating dinner at a party, for some reason, there they are, lurking in the background, judging, and making a plan to execute Jesus. And as Jesus processes into Jerusalem amid fanfare and praise and palm branches and shouts of Hosanna, the religious leaders are there, putting the finishing touches on their plan. A plan that they would set in motion in just a few days. In just a, sh a few short days, the cries of, Hosanna, blessed be the King of Israel, take a drastic turn. And the cries then become, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. But in this part of the story, the religious leaders play an important role. The Pharisees play an important role because, as is so common in the Gospel of John, they speak, and they speak more than they know. They say these words, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The world has gone after him. Obviously, they're exaggerating. Obviously, this wasn't the case, but they spoke more than they knew because Jesus isn't only king of Israel, king of the Jews, as Pilate would have put on the sign above Jesus on the cross. He is indeed king of the world. And going back to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, it said that he shall rule from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. The Pharisees may have been exaggerating. Maybe they were even speaking a little bit sarcastically. But their words were true. Their words point to a time when the good news of Jesus Christ will spread to the ends of the earth, to every tribe and tongue, and people and nation. So we started out this morning by asking the question, what happened before the triumphal entry? What happened before? And we'll close by asking this question. What happened next? What happened next? Well, on Monday, Jesus curses the fig tree and he cleanses the temple. On Tuesday, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple and his own return. On Wednesday... Judas Iscariot agrees to betray Jesus. On Thursday, Jesus celebrates the Passover meal with his disciples. On Thursday, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, a meal that we still celebrate today as a church. On Thursday, Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. On Friday, Jesus is questioned by Annas. He is condemned by Caiaphas. 
On Friday, Jesus is questioned by Pilate, sent to Herod, and sent back to Pilate. On Friday, Jesus is condemned to die on a cross. On Friday, he is crucified at Calvary. On Friday, he dies on that cross. On Friday, he is buried in a tomb that belongs to Joseph of Arimathea. On Saturday, what a day Saturday must have been that weekend. What a day that Saturday must have been. On Saturday, Jesus' body lay in a tomb. And on Sunday, on Sunday, you're going to have to come back next week to find out what happened on Sunday. Amen.